Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. In 1925, college football still reigned supreme. The NFL was desperately yearning for something to come along to put it on the map. Two men had the answer. George Hallis and Dutch Sternemann would turn to a ghost to shock the nation into believing in the NFL as a legitimate venue. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the incredible career and life of the Galloping Ghost and how he was able to legitimize the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time we step off our DeLorean, and the date is June 13th, 1903. And we are in Forksville, Pennsylvania, our hero is none other than Harold Edward Grange. Most know him as Red Grange. I mean, I I knew him as Red Grange before I even really know who Red Grange was. I've always heard the name. I've also heard a nickname that he would end up becoming throughout his college career, and that is the Galloping Ghost, which we're going to get into a little bit later in the episode, why he was given this name and whom gave them that name. But basically, it kind of broke down to he had elusiveness, speed, and, I mean, I just got to go ahead and say it, possibly we could say the original Barry Sanders, if you know what I mean. But we're going to go ahead and start this a little bit earlier in Grange's life. You see, back in Forestville, his father, Lyle, was a, originally a foreman at a lumber company. And unfortunately, when Grange was five years old, his mother passed away. So in the grief that Lyle had, he moved his family to Wheaton, Illinois, where he had family originally. And then from what it looked like, he would end up rising to become the police chief. In a documentary that I saw that I will be talking throughout this episode about called Larger Than Life, The Red Grange Story. And you can go ahead and search for that in the YouTube verse, or you can go on to my website in the show notes, and I'll include a link there for you. But in the video, it described how Lyle just, you know, was torn up with grief, so he had to move his family out of the area. and. He went to Wheaton because they had family there previously. So that kind of gets the ball rolling for the story for Mr. Grange. As far as his sports story, he was a star athlete while at Wheaton High School in Illinois, where he would go on to earn 16 letters. And his letters came in football, baseball, basketball, and track, where he was a four-time sprint champion. Basically, it's like his dude fast. And to kind of keep his body in shape, it looked like uh, he held, he was like a helper on an ice truck where he just took these like 40 or 50 pound blocks of ice and he would help deliver them. So, you know, he was used to this heavy work, even as a high schooler. And they would go on calling him the Wheaton Iceman. But getting into his uh, football career at high school, apparently, you know, of course he had his, you know, amazing career and all sorts of stuff in high school because he was just physically more gifted and talented than basically everybody on the field. But I saw where they said in his final game in high school for the DuPage County Championship against the Downers Grove, he alone scored 45 points, a record still today in championships, according to Encyclopedia.com. I mean, well, you know, I mean, I did some research and I found, you know, top points scored by football players in high school for games, but it didn't like specify that it was a championship game. So. If you do figure that out, go ahead and let me know. In the same article where it mentioned that he scored 45 points in the championship game, it discussed a 
game against Scott High School, which I guess was just a powerful school at the time, where he was knocked unconsciousness in his senior year, and he would remain unconscious for the next two days. And then it would say he'd have difficulty speaking for a time after that, which probably led him to possibly decide to play a different sport in college. Well, initially, that is, of course. But there was an article that said, Despite scoring 75 touchdowns and 532 points in high school, Grange considered skipping football at Illinois and competing in basketball and track. But it would also go on to say that his fraternity brothers at Zeta Psi would convince him to play. And I think we all have the members of Zeta Psi to thank for doing this. Now stepping forward a little bit to 1922, this is when Red Grange would enter the University of Illinois. And that same video I discussed, it talked about Coach Robert Zupke, who was basically like legendary. I mean, he was like, legendary. He was pretty much like the most legendary coach out there. And uh, I seen it where they called him Mr. Razzle Dazzle because he uh, created all sorts of different plays and the flea flicker and screen pass and all sorts of things. So um, now I know those don't really seem that crazy to us nowadays because they're just normal. But just go ahead and think about it. Like nowadays in the NFL, we have Sean McVay, the new blood, the young blood. And he's just, you know, taking the league by storm. He's got all these crazy offensive genius minds and he's been molded from Mr. John Gruden himself to become the wunderkind. I mean, maybe he wasn't quite all that, but he was considered Mr. Razzle Dazzle. And in the video, they described how he was pretty much kind of like, I don't know, obligated to go to the track and field and kind of watch these guys run in the, I'm using quotes again, hopes that he would find somebody that could razzle dazzle him. And normally he would go there, appease the, the coaches or the fans or whatever it was. And he would basically say, okay, I'm out of here. I mean, that was a, yeah, that was a waste of my time, but okay, thanks for coming to the show. And, you know, he'd bounce and he'd get out of there. But it described one time where he showed up, he saw a bolt of lightning. Kind of reminds me of faster than a speeding bullet, stronger than a mighty plane or, I don't know, he's just like super fast, man. Like those bullet trains you see over in Europe. You know what his name was? It was Mr. Harold Grange. Red Grange, that is. And he said, you know what, that dude's really fast, and uh, I'm looking at these guys over here, and they're not quite as fast. If I, like, put him on my team, and he went against them, hey, yo, I think we got some cooking. He'd be like Bo Jackson and Tecmo Bowl. I mean, Tecmo Bowl didn't come out yet at the time, but just imagine how good Bo Jackson was in that game. And then you'll kind of get a glimpse into what we're going to discuss, why this dude would end up becoming known as the Galloping Ghost. And why he would ultimately end up being the savior of the NFL. See, he was a halfback known for his long, dazzling runs. And of course, because he was so good, he would ultimately become an All-American in each of his college seasons. I mean, in his first game, he scored three touchdowns, including a punt return. And that was against Nebraska, where at the time, Nebraska was, I think, a pretty good school. And then in his sophomore year, he would end up leading an undefeated Illinois team to a unanimous championship. And these are some pretty amazing feats, but they ain't got nothing on the moment from the game that would turn a young man from the middle of nowhere into this iconic, legendary, the myth, the man, the legend of Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost. That game would come in 1924 against the highly rated Michigan team. Let's get a backstory though. Apparently, Michigan and Illinois were bitter rivals. Now, going back to that Larger Than Life video, they would interview Grange on there. And this is an older gentleman. Grange was uh, maybe in his 70s, early 80s, something like that. And he was recalling different kinds of things that the interviewer wanted to talk about. And one of them was, he described how his coach Zupke, from basically the middle of June of that year, would send him a letter each week describing how they're going to whoop all over Michigan. They're going to beat them, those dirty scoundrels, you know, whatever they would say back in the 20s to get a rouse out of somebody. And he said that, you know, I didn't really have much hate, but those letters kind of turned me into, you know, wanting to whoop up all over on them or, you know, I didn't really take too kindly to them or, you know, I'm paraphrasing exactly what he said, but basically he was saying that, you know, this constant each week writing this letter 
really got him and his teammates going. They were all fired up. So it was already going to be a game to remember. But not one person in this universe could have had any clue that it would be like capital T-H-E period 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 maybe exclamation mark and then let's just go ahead and create a character because it, you can't describe it in the modern English language of how much of a sensational single game performance this was. And you're going to figure out why. So leading up to it, the team that Zupke wants to be, wants to crush, Michigan, they had an unbeaten streak already of 20 games. And it was said that they only allowed four total touchdowns for the entire two previous seasons. So we're talking about like a dominating, fearsome defense. Something that should not be reckoned with. But Zupke had plans. And he had an ace up his sleeve. He was like thinking to himself, I got this marble. Like this special marble. I'm going to slap it in my slingshot. I'm going to pull that sucker back and I'm going to let it fly. And that marble would be Red Grange. Now we're at the game. And I'm getting kind of excited because this was the first time when I'm doing the research for the Football History Dude, where I was able to watch actual game footage. It's pretty neat to think about a game back in 1925, almost 100 years ago, and you can actually watch some game footage of it. Again, I highly recommend you go into the episode show notes so you can go ahead and see all the different links that I provide to you for the different videos. And um, that's going to go ahead and be at thefootballhistorydude.com slash episode 5. But I'm going to get some of my giddiness out of the way and stop trying to be so get so geeked about this because we got to talk about this game. I hope I've built up the anticipation and you're as excited as I am to listen to what I'm about to say. So let's close our eyes once again. Think about being in 1925 at a stadium jam-packed with what was said to be 60 to 65,000 fans at the Memorial Stadium. And this was... The homecoming for Illinois. So you mean this is a rowdy bunch of people. And Michigan comes in with all their swagger. And they say you ain't coming to cross this. This is an impenetrable line of defense. Like I said. They only let up four touchdowns. The entire past two years. So here's the opening kickoff. Red Grange is sitting back. Waiting for that ball. Coming down from the heavens. The football gods have dropped this brown golden nugget into his arms. And he does like I said. And he's like a marble. He catches that right in his bread basket. And he's like, boom! Shoots out of a cannon. Up through the field. Cuts to the left. Cuts to the right. Down the side. He is just going bonkers. Crazy fast past all the defenders. Into the end zone. And the crowd goes wild. They're like, what? No way. This is crazy. I can't believe this is really happening against Michigan. I think on the radio they were like, is this a fluke? But it was real. He went... 95 yards to the house, to the hizzy, against Michigan, the top-rated defense, the top-rated team. Not losing a game in 20 games, what's up? But then, something crazy happened. You see, I guess they had some weird rule back then where, when you get scored upon, you have the opportunity to either receive the ball or kick the ball to the opponent. Which I'm like, what? I'm listening here, I'm listening to this video while I'm at the gym, and I'm like, did I just hear that dude right? Why would you ever want to kick the ball? But he said, and it kind of made sense, that they would kick the ball in the hopes and attempt that you would gain an advantage in field position, which of course they did not have such a high flying offense like they do nowadays. So Michigan kicks the ball off. Red Grange fields the ball. Of course he'd be tackled, which no big deal. But then the first, (laughs) I'm telling you, the first play from line of scrimmage, that dude shoots out of the cannon again for 67 yards and they are just madhouse they showed the fans in the stands and they were doing some kind of like bob and weave and back and forth all together in one big mob it was kind of like almost like a wave or a mosh pit i mean it was just they were just blowing out their minds and there was a radio station uh wgn the famous the famous wgn was announcing their very first football game for this game and apparently when they broadcast it they said that people thought it was a joke no way would they score two touchdowns like that on michigan not in a million years but he wasn't done there red grange would go on to score another touchdown of 56 yards and 44 yards all in the first quarter that's right he scored four touchdowns in the first quarter which equaled the same amount of touchdowns that michigan gave up 
in the two previous seasons combined in one quarter. Talk about a coming out party of magnificent proportions. He would end up running in the second half for a fifth touchdown. And then, because, you know, I got to put that cherry on top, I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to throw a touchdown pass for good measure. And the score would end up being 39-14 to for an Illinois victory. And yes, again, it was against an unbeaten Michigan team. Now, of course, you know, they probably didn't have fantasy football back then, but if they did, the players would just be salivating. I mean, even just the first quarter alone. But his final stats were 212 rushing yards, 64 passing, 126 kickoff return yards, and 6 touchdowns. Of course, one was a pass. But dang, one of the best fantasy performances of all time. I wish I had some DraftKings money on that one. Meh, oh well. But even though that was like a game of the century, a performance of the century, whatever you want to call it, the interview that they had with Grange in the video, he said, well, uh, anybody could have made those runs. My grandmother could have, because she's only 90 years old. I just thought it was kind of, you know, cute little old dude saying these things and, you know, thinking that as he gets older, you know, he's going to become wiser and things like that. But what I find out is basically, no matter where you go, everything, everybody called him just this gentleman, down to the earth, kind of cool cat. So, scratching my head and I'm thinking, hmm, that's right, Barry Sanders, hand the bottle to the ref. Mr. Professional. You know I gotta bring that Lions into there. So, like I said, he was nicknamed the Galloping Ghost. And this game definitely helped that. So the the guy that gave him the nickname was Grantland Rice. And yes, that's the guy that we talked about in the first episode. That ended up taking over for the All-American team selection for Mr. Walter Camp. And he ended up writing a poem about the Galloping Ghost. And it goes as such. A streak of fire. A breath of flame. Eluding all who reach and clutch. A gray ghost thrown into the game. That rival hands may never touch. A rubber bounding, blasting soul, whose destination is the goal. Another performance that he ended up having, and they described in the video as well, was against Pennsylvania. See, at the time, the Eastern football clubs didn't really think much of the Midwest teams. So, it's kind of a big game. Kind of put the Midwest on the map. So, all he did was just go out there, score three touchdowns, and gain 363 yards, and, you know, they'd beat the team 24-2. to two. And he has a, like, face. But we got to go ahead and get past college. We got to get towards that time where he's going to revolutionize. He's going to time shift, alter, and he's going to go ahead and take the NFL from just a, what they called a beer league, into the ranks of something that would be legitimized and even sought after for years to come. This is where George Hallis comes into the picture, the owner of the Chicago Bears at the time. And he is, in his own right, one of the more famous dudes in the NFL. But he recognized that they needed to do something different to be able to start drawing in ticket sales and bring fans to the stadium if the league was going to survive. And it said that star college players rarely turned to the pros back then. But Hallis and his partner Dutch Sternemann knew that Grange could make a difference. If they could only just bring him into the team, he could be the savior of the NFL. The galloping ghost. The one that nobody can see, the galloping ghost, on the Bears, with Hallis. It could be a match made in heaven, and they would end up getting this guy. You see, Grange had an agent that went by the name of C.C. Pyle, which stood for Cash and Carry Pyle. Kind of seemed like he was a, I don't want to say shady, but almost like a shady, just a business shark, just going to go out and do all these different kind of shady moves. Apparently he, you know, went into a theater where he saw Grange and... Someone came up to Grange and said, hey, Pyle wants to talk to you. And Pyle under the, you know, kind of like behind scenes doors, closed doors, is all like, hey, I've got all this stuff lined up for you. As soon as you get out of college, we're going to make you a pro. We're going to travel the nation. We're going to go make a lot of money. But they couldn't really talk about it, of course, because he was still a college player at the time. And as we discussed in the last episode, there was a crackdown on college player rules. So they had to wait until he was done with college. And to kind of go along with this whole college and pros and stuff like that, there was a quote from Grange that said, I'd have been more popular with the colleges if I had joined Capone's mob in Chicago rather than the Bears. But thankfully, he did not join Capone's mob. He did join the Bears. In fact, after his last college game, he signed immediately with the Bears. There was some rumblings and there was some kind of like collusion stuff going on and 
back door like, hey, there's like no way that you did the proper channels there. And there would be some stuff down the road that we're going to talk about later that would prevent a player from signing so quickly as far as they would have to, they couldn't sign until their, like their class was graduated kind of thing. So there was like a waiting period, but that was not in place yet. So Red Grange was able to play 10 days later on Thanksgiving in front of 36,000 fans, which at the time was the largest attendance for a pro football game ever. And it was all because the fans wanted to see Red Grange, the galloping ghost. So they filled Cubs Park, which now is Wrigley Field, for Grange's debut. It was the Chicago Bears against the Chicago Cardinals. Thanksgiving. This is football, man. Let's get it on. The game was, let's just say, a wild success. The papers were blowing up. You know, they didn't have the Twitters and the Facebooks back then, but the equivalent of such things, you know, snail mail, Pony Express, whatever you want to call it, the little tapping on the, you know, the, you know what I'm talking about, the, what is that thing called? The telegraph, that thing. You know, like, Red Grange, just super, awesome, come see him now, that kind of thing. But then 10 days later, he would basically just break the bank for the New York Giants, and it would be at New York's Polo Grounds. They would end up having 70,000 fans. Basically, again, they got to see the galloping ghosts in person. I mean, it's not like you just flip on the TV or even nowadays watch on your phone just to see the game live. You had to actually go to this thing. I mean, you could listen to the radio, but nothing could compare to being in the stands, the raw, pure energy of watching this dude shot out of a cannon, boatening like Zeus godlike, and just running down the field, streaking. So, like I said, 70,000 fans would fill the New York Polo Grounds. And they said that before this, it was like one of those Hail Mary kind of deals. The New York Giants were going broke. You know, broke as a joke, man. So they just brought in Grange and the Chicago Bears. And all these fans, of course, are going to pay to get in. So they say that basically Red Grange saved the New York Giants franchise. So there you go, Eli. You're welcome. Now, Grange's agent, Mr. Hallis, and his partner, Sterneman, they weren't no fool. They realized that they had a rare opportunity to capitalize on. Something that does not come around, but every once in a blue moon. So they set up what they called a quote-unquote barnstorming tour, where he would end up playing eight games in 12 days in the East and Midwest. Then he would go South and West to play nine more games. Basically, it was like, this dude is bringing in fans galore. NFL Professional football has never seen such a draw. The college ranks have seen stuff like this, but even then it wasn't quite as big. So we have got to hop on this pony. We have got to take it over there to the West Coast. And they would. They would play a game in Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum against the Los Angeles Tigers in front of 75,000 fans. That's like, you know, nowadays kind of normal sized stadiums. Well, I mean, a little bit smaller, but still, you're talking 1920s, man. Like, for real. We are on to something here. The NFL is picking up chugga, 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 steam. And let's go. Let's do this. And Pyle and Hallis and Sterneman, Grange, they're all like, yeah, let's keep going. I mean, he was getting rich. Of course, Pyle is getting rich, too. And Hallis and Sterneman, because they're the owners. A figure that I heard in that video was between the gate receipts and his salary, he was said to have made nearly $30,000 per game compared to the average football player at the time making $150 per game. As I'm sitting here, uh, not too long ago, I know this is dating the podcast, but Matt Ryan just signed like a Muku, Boku, boatload of kind of money guaranteed. So, uh, Mr. Ryan, you have Mr. Grange to thank for that because that dude was the one who really put the NFL on the map. Like, you know, throwing a pin up against the wall and saying, yep, we are here. We ain't going nowhere. So just sit back and enjoy, baby. And supposedly, during the tour, Mr. Babe Ruth himself, you know, the famous Babe Ruth when he was at the New York Polo Grounds game, would uh, welcome himself into Grange's hotel room. And there was a quote that he said, and it went as such, kid, don't believe anything they write about you. And don't pick up too many dinner checks. Babe Ruth was, uh, maybe he was drinking at the time. I don't know. He was known to be a dude that kicked back the little brown jugs. So, basically, like I said, 
Red Grange is, if not mostly, at least partly responsible for popularizing the professional football ranks at the time, basically setting it on a trajectory to where it is today. Possibly without him and his stardom and his famous nickname, we might not have the NFL today, but I don't know. Then we're going to go on to the 1926 season. His agent Pyle and Bears ownership could not agree on terms. Pyle told the Bears that Grange would not play for them unless he was paid a five-figure salary and given one-third ownership of the team. Now, the Bears were not down with this. So basically, it was kind of like they were calling their bluff. So Pyle said, you know what? Screw you guys. I'm going to New York. And then he would form the New York Yankees. Not the baseball team, New York Yankees. I'm talking about the New York Yankees football team. And he would petition to get the New York football Yankees into the NFL. But he was denied. So he was all, Jerry Maguire, he's all like, okay, fine, I'm out of here. Now, who's coming with me? You know, I'm like, show me the money. Who's coming with me? And Grange did, because, you know, that was his agent. So they started the New York Yankees in a new league, which would be the first rendition of the American Football League. And, of course, Grange was the famous player for the New York Yankees. But, unfortunately, I don't know how many games into the season, uh, Grange suffered a devastating or crippling knee injury against the Bears. And I'm thinking, was this payback or was this a coincidence? But either which way, without Grange, nobody wanted to come to the games. So the 1927 season was the first for the AFL, and then it would be the last for the AFL. You see, they would fold, Pyle would have to crawl back, with his tail between his legs, and beg again for admittance to the NFL. And it's sad to think about Grange getting that devastating knee injury because he was still in his prime of his career. He could have dispensed oh so much more. But with going back to some of our famous players back in the day, Bo Jackson, for instance, you know, you get that crippling injury and you just are never the same. And there was a quote from Grange discussing his injury. He said this, I didn't play at all in 1928. I was just an ordinary ball carrier after that. I did develop into a pretty good defensive back, however. And an article I found on NFL.com said that Grange and what I'm kind of gathering almost like a rival, Ernie Nevers, both retired during the 1928 seasons. And teams dwindled down to only 10. Now, when you have two of your biggest stars going out, and you really don't have a whole lot of stars going on, Man, this is like serious business. We potentially could lose a league because if fans aren't going to come to the game, we can't pay for that slab of meat that's sliding across our tables and we're going to consume into our tummies. And of course, even worse, our entire league could implode and go broke. So, I mean, nowadays we have more um, than one player that has this amount of clout in the NFL. But, I mean, think about it. When one team's like franchise quarterback goes down, a la day, Indianapolis Colts last year with Andrew Luck or even back when they had Peyton Manning and he went down basically the fans just are like I give up I don't care about the season let's just think about next season but if you're that deep in and you're that far down there might not be a next season but we got lucky whoo dodge a bullet the NFL would survive just barely holding on by a string and then it started to come back and then in 1929 Mr. George Hallis would invite Grange back to the Bears and he would end up playing with them until 1934. And during his, you know, kind of like, I guess you can call it reunion tour, comeback special, whatever, he played mostly defensive back, but he was still a big contributor to the team. There were a couple different games that were pointed out during his, you know, I guess you can call it his back nine of his career. Um, One was on November 28, 1929 against the Chicago Cardinals, and this game was going to go down in history. But actually, it's not history for Red Grange. You're like, wait a second, I thought we were talking about Red Grange. But it was kind of cool because... The impressive stat line that comes out of this is from what, I mean, like I said, I don't really know if it's a rival or just when you have two big names in the sport at the same time, but his counterpart, Ernie Nesser, who I said earlier had previously retired in 1928, came roaring back. He would proceed to score six rushing touchdowns and four extra points, which means that he contributed 
40 points in that game on November 20th, 1929. And what is even cooler is that is still an NFL record to think. An NFL record again. That long. 40 points. Let's go ahead and see if anybody from my fantasy football team can beat that next year. And they didn't really start keeping official stats until 1932. So I'm not really sure how many official yards he had during that, but let's just go ahead and give him, I don't know, a random 150 yards, which probably were actually more than that, but we'll kind of be conservative. So if he had 150 rushing yards and he had six touchdowns and four extra points, that's a whopping 55 fantasy points in standard scoring. All I can say is, dang, if I had him on my team, then I'd be like that guy in the commercial. All I could say is, championship. But speaking of championship, December 18th, 1932, would end up becoming the NFL's very first playoff game because it was a championship game. Basically, the scoring standings were tied for the first time ever. So they wonderfully and brilliantly decided, let's have a playoff game. Basically, a winner takes all. Thus, the championship game is going to be born. The game would be between the Chicago Bears and the Portsmouth Spartans, which, by the way, would ultimately become my Detroit Lions in 1934. Kaboom! But then I bring that kaboom back to a moobach. Because I gotta kind of flip it down and reverse it, because, as you find out later, as a Lions fan, I might not be too happy with the outcome. But it would also be the first indoor game. See, it was held indoors at Chicago Stadium due to frigid cold and snow. But the field was only 80 yards because, you know, it was a stadium that wasn't really built for football stadium. And if you look back at the picture and the link I'm going to provide to you, it's kind of cool because it basically looked like modern day arena football league where the field just, it has these walls and like there's no sidelines. It's basically the sidelines are the walls. So, you know, probably smash right up inside of the wall, you know, kind of running down the line. Check, there you go. So going back to why I said as a Lions fan, I'm not going to be too happy with the outcome. The winning touchdown was a pass from Bronco Nagurski to Red Green. And the Spartans would claim that Bronco was not at least five yards from the scrimmage, but the play would end up standing. You see, I guess they had a rule that, you know, as long you like it wasn't where you have to just throw the ball before you get to the line of scrimmage. You had to actually be five yards behind the line of scrimmage. So they didn't have instant replay. They couldn't really just overrule it or anything. And I'm sure there was some kind of what you call home field advantage with the refs. Got all these fans in the stands. I'm going to call it a touchdown. And not to get all, you know, gritty toasted oats on you, but this reminds me of another controversial game that happened in Chicago. And it was the Detroit Lions. Remember that whole Calvin Johnson catch or not catch or hold on to the ball through the motion or keep possession throughout the play or whatever they wanted to call it and basically made the Lions lose and I think that was what was the game that could have turned them into making the playoffs that year and possibly going to the Super Bowl. I'm just going to go back and I'm just say they ended up changing that rule again. But there's a conspiracy of epic proportions that go back to Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1932 election. You see, he won in a landslide as a Democrat, even though the Republicans had ruled almost everything since 1860. In fact, he won 42 states to Hoover's six. Now, I'm not on either side of the parties. I really don't care. But I'm just saying, there's something amiss here. Hoover was easily nominated at the Republican convention in June, which, yes, was in Chicago. Coincidence? I think not. I'm thinking they were a little bit sour about the loss, since they lost the presidency a month earlier, on November 8th, 1932. Just saying, just saying. Franklin D. Roosevelt and Herbert Hoover are to blame for Calvin Johnson not being awarded that catch. And I just haven't figured it out. I don't know how. I gotta connect the dots. So what I'm saying is, if there's not an episode that's dropped next week, you know the government's on to me, and they got to me. But just in case I am able to put out episode 6 of the Football History Dude, I want to go ahead and remind you, for you to get the newest, freshest, hottest off the press episodes, I'm asking you to please go on over to your favorite podcast player, smash that little subscribe button, that way you get the newest, 
release episodes automatically downloaded into your mobile device or your computer or whatever you listen to. So then it's sitting there ready for you every Wednesday morning to be able to listen to the Football History Dude. And if you're not quite sure how to do that, head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash subscribe and where I explain to you how you can subscribe to your favorite podcast player. And I'm always willing to help you out to help grow this podcast community. So if you want, you can hit me up at Twitter and my handle is at FHDude. But getting back to Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost, his final hurrah. And it's the 1933 championship game. There was a highlight. They say that Grange was the defensive hero of the game, making a difficult touchdown saving tackle in the closing seconds. Kind of reminds me of the New England Patriots a couple Super Bowls ago. But moving forward, past football, I mean, Red, let, let's, just, let's just say it. Red Grange was one of the most influential and awesome football players to ever step foot on the gridiron. But he did a lot of other things. I mean, some things I found was he was an insurance business guy. He did some acting. Uh, he was an assistant coach. Um, he even made movies, you know, like beyond acting and some TV. Um, he was part of many different advertisements. You know, Mr. Cash and Carry Pyle, he's got to go ahead and take advantage of this famed Mr. Red Grange as much as he can. Reminds me of movie actors or athletes and things like that nowadays where you know, you're hot, you got like that five minute hot rule and you've got to get everything you can while you're in. Because once you out, you out. There is even a, a Red Grange candy bar that came out. I would like to say that I'd like to try one of those, but if it's, you know, like 90 years old, it's probably not any good anymore. But it would be cool if somebody out there has access to one, like, you know, like in a museum or something like that, and you could take a picture or snap a shot of photo, send it to me. That would be super cool to put into my website. But then beyond all these other things, he was like huge in broadcasting, collegiate and professional. In fact, he was the Bears announcer from 1947 to 1961, where he would end up announcing 312 games. There's just too much to talk about when it comes to Mr. Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost. So let's kind of go over a few brief recaps of his life accomplishments. He would end up becoming a charter member of the College and Pro Football Hall of Fames. He was number 77, which I gotta say, honestly, I have always looked at number 77 as a boring number, but I will never again look at number 77 as a boring number. If I see 77, ultimately I'm going to thank the Galloping Ghost. He will go on to become one of the most famous football players of the 20th century. In a quote from Damon Runyon, probably summed it up just about as good as anybody could. And the quote went as such, This man, Red Grange of Illinois, is three or four men rolled into one for football purposes. He is Jack Dempsey, Babe Ruth, Al Jolson, Pavo Nurmi, and Man o' War. Put together, they spell Grange. And to kind of get like a idea and grasp of how modern day people describe the legend that is Red Grange, a 2010 NFL Films Top 100 Players of All Time put him at number 48. And when you listen to the clip that described him, it started off like this. Not even Paul Bunyan's blue ox had a mythology greater than Harold Red Grange, whose life and times were fertile ground for many a tall tale. I mean, just listening to that when I watched it, I definitely recommend you watch that too. Uh, It was just super cool and kind of like spine chingling. But unfortunately, as everybody does, Mr. Grange would pass away on January 8th 1991 at the age of 87 in Lake Wales, Florida. But I'm telling you, he was like a humble dude. And they talked about it. Um, George Hallis in the interview talked about, you know, just no matter what, he was just a straightforward dude. Um, And just pretty much every analyst or interviewee, just that's all they could talk about is he had all this fame, but he was down to earth. If you didn't know him by his face and you didn't know who this guy was, you would have never known that he was like the Biggest, I'm talking about the, with like 17 E's, biggest name in sports at the time. There was another quote that I have from Grange himself that said this, They built my accomplishments way out of proportion. I never got the idea that I was a tremendous big shot. I could carry a football well, but there were a lot of doctors and teachers and engineers that could do their thing better than I. And I'm going to kind of 
get close to wrapping this up with another quote that really tells you what just just a good guy this was. Consummate, professional, and teammate. When they asked him about his favorite moment throughout his career, he didn't bring up the Michigan game, which is what everybody else brings up. Instead, he brought up just some random game against Iowa, where the team won, where Earl Britton, his primary run blocker, kicked a 55-yard field goal. And why he said he remembered it was, quote, I held the ball for him. As in, he was so proud that his run blocker scored that field goal and he got to be a part of it to help his teammate out. I'm telling you, I believe football is a sport that can bring on camaraderie unlike most things out there. But this guy had it. And I would love to see any young fan that's listening to this be like Grange. Don't be like some of those prissy pants, superstars that think they're better than everybody. Be like the galloping ghost. Now let's bring this thing home. Harold Edward Grange is not a well-known name, but most NFL fans know the name Red Grange. Although these names were of the same dude, one was a myth and the other was a legend. To this day, he still has one of the coolest and most accurately descriptive nicknames, the Galloping Ghost. However, one conversation could have possibly changed the fate of the entire NFL if his fraternity brothers from Zeta Psi had not convinced him to play football at the University of Illinois. You and I may not have even heard of the NFL. I hope you liked this episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about one of the greatest running backs of all time, Red Grange. Next week, we talk about the Galloping Ghost teammate, who I believe had one of the coolest pure football names of all time. Until next time, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.